Hello, and welcome to yet another edition of Healing Hacks Happy Hour. Uh, my name is Travis. Uh, I go by TT on Discord. We have a couple of folks that, uh, from Data Cake that are going to be giving us a presentation on dashboarding today. So uh, I'm very excited about that. I know a, a number of you out there have been using Data Cake and their platform. So I guess, um, how's everyone doing? How's your week doing? What's, uh, what's going on? Not much. Not everybody talk at once. Yeah, Just right. working some documentation for platform IO, trying to get that squared away. Very cool. Yeah, our new doc site uh, should be going live here shortly. So um, I think we're all very excited about that. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll give it a start. So uh, I'm Lucas. I'm uh, from Datacake, and I will show you some some things about Datacake later as well. So I'm uh, pretty new to uh, Helium. I'm from Germany, and as some of you might know, Helium unfortunately is not that popular in Germany yet. Um, but I hope that will, and I'm sure that will uh, change in the very future. So. Um, yeah, um, I have some experience with our uh, other LoRaWAN uh, network service and systems, but um, I really like the the story behind Helium and uh, what's it all about. Excellent, and and thank you very much for um, for joining us and you know presenting on your your software offerings today. Yeah, uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity. My name is Andy Nadler. I'm a um, I'm more of the I guess on the the user side of it, I'm an agricultural meteorologist, so I'm looking at ways to measure plants, what they do, farming, that type of thing. So I've been playing around with a lot of things. Um, Travis, you you and I have been on the phone before with Henry, getting set up with the, the hotspot. And then uh, just in the last couple of weeks, I've been working with uh, Simon at Data Cake. I've been playing around with that on some weather monitoring. So I was really, really excited to, to see that uh, that uh, Lucas is going to be on here to talk about Data Cake because I... I I, I've been really impressed. It's pretty easy. I'm not a coder, so um, I found it pretty easy to put together. I did some dashboards and stuff, and you know, like I say, it wasn't it wasn't uh, rocket science to do. So I really liked it. So I'm looking forward to this. Very cool. Yeah, it's good to have you, man. Thanks. That's uh, very nice and good to hear as well. We are Data Cake, and um, let's give you a bit of a backstory how it all started. So um, a couple of years ago, I met Simon. Um, who became my co-founder and um, back then he was working in his family business. They are uh, a manufacturer of welding fume um, extraction machines, so air filters and air quality monitoring for the industrial sector. And they have been doing this for, uh, I think, 40 years now. And um, Around 2014, they, uh, the, the topic of industrial IoT um, was getting bigger in Germany and um, they were also looking for ways to monitor their, um, their yeah, air filters um, from, from a distance to um, solve things like servers or get uh, notifications when a filter becomes full. And um, 2014 does not sound that long ago, but if you look at uh, what was technically possible um, back then, um, the landscape was totally different. So um, they were um, trying different things, inviting vendors like Siemens and all the big players. Um, they came to it, their headquarters with like their suits on and um, putting like big ballpark numbers on the table and saying that, yeah, we can do this, but it will cost you like half a million or whatever. And um, Simon, who was also um, like technically interested, thought to himself like, that doesn't sound right. There, there must be, there must be ways, and um, of course there are ways, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And um, yeah, um, I think Simon just joined, um, so uh, maybe you can hear me. <laughs> and um, so yeah, we connected and we knew each other actually from Twitter. And um, I have a software background, been building software systems for for a while now. And here's more like the electronics and the mechanical um, background. And um, yeah, he reached out to me and um, uh, told me his story and asked me what I was thinking. And I said, yeah, of course, uh, we can take existing things and combine them and um, make a solution for you. And um, we quickly discovered that um, the solution that we are building for this specific use case was not really limited to this use case because um, other companies from Germany had like the exact same problem or like 90% of the same problems. So um, 
from the beginning, we built a platform that were, would be able to adapt to different use cases very easily. And um, yeah, and that's that's how Data Cake came along. So um, in the beginning, as I said, there was no Laura run around, especially not in Germany. And so um, first we built our own hardware based on a cellular model uh, module. So it's called a cellular PLC controller. That's what we call it. And it's still in use uh, today. It's in some machines. And what it allows you, you put it into the machine, connect your industrial sensors and um, set the mapping in, in software. So everything is software defined. So you don't, don't have to know how to code. You don't really have to know how the sensors work because everything you need to know is in the data sheet and it connects via cellular as I said and to a platform and all the configuration is a web-based interface so it's was very easy for for like industrial companies who did not know anything about software development to get their machines online and um, yeah of course this is not what we're doing today um, the landscape evolved and Laura came around uh, also here in Germany and um, our neighboring country the, the Netherlands they are pretty advanced with, uh, with LoRa coverage. Fortunately, not Helium uh, so far, but they have like uh, KPN, the, the national uh, telephone provider has, has like a nationwide um, LoRa network, their commercial one. Um, don't have to use it, but it's, it's there. So um, yeah, so um, nowadays Data Cake is a platform you can still onboard like cellular sensors or other API devices but we made Laura One devices the first class citizens. And um, a couple of months ago, we um, got a lot of requests from American customers actually who were on the Helium network already. And they asked us um, if we could like introduce a Helium integration. And um, to be honest, we had heard about Helium before, but as I said, it was not a big thing in Germany, unfortunately yet. So we looked into it and were amazed um, by the story and what it's doing and what um, the customers reaching out, um, out to us were doing. And so um, we got in touch with uh, the guys at Helium and looked at the documentation and it was, was actually very straightforward because um, the developer documentation, I assume many of you know, are pretty good. So um, like a week later, we uh, had a working Helium integration and I'm um, going to show it to you now. So for this, we have a um, test setup at um, Simon's home. So it's, it's not here, unfortunately. <laughs> so uh, he has the Helium router and um, a LoRaWAN sensor next to it, which is actually one of our own sensors. So we have taken, let me see, I have another picture from Simon. This is the internals. We have taken a uh, PyCom low Pi and attached a Sensirion um, particulate matter money, um, sensor to it. So it's measuring fine dust uh, in the air quality. And this is actually a modular sensor board um, where you can attach multiple sensors to it, but maybe Simon can talk a bit about later. Um, so as I said, this is Simon's place. Here I have my Helium console and uh, we see it's called the Data Cake Dust Control. It's connected and right now it's set up to transmit the data every minute just for demonstration purposes. Of course, in real life case, uh, you would not transmit that often probably. So um, if you go to Data Cake and create an account, um, you will, the first screen you will see is a list of devices here. In this case, I have already created this device so it can collect some historical data, I'll show you in a minute. But um, what you will want to do is click Add Device and then you can select from multiple device types. So we are adding a LoRaWAN device. And um, what I mean by making LoRaWAN sensors first class citizens is that we have created a so-called templates for a lot of devices from different vendors already and are about to release um, support for community templates in the next weeks. So everyone can create uh, templates for their sensors and contribute them. And what this does is, uh, for example, if you take a, a Dragino LHT65, which is a temperature and humidity sensor. So in the next screen, you select your um, network server, which in this case, of course, is Helium. And um, then you have to select a device plan. So um, pricing on DataCake works is basically by how much and how long you want to store the data. and uh, Two devices are always free, so um, you can give it a try without entering a credit card or whatever. 
Um, so let's select a free device, click next. Then we have to give it a name, let's say a test sensor and enter the device, uh, device URI. I am making this one up right now. And um, then you have the um, LNS set, set up instructions. Um, you will also find them in the next step and also in the documentation. So let's click add device. It's taking a second to load and um, create the device in the background. So um, this is the dashboard I was talking about. Um, of course, this is uh, all zero values because there's no real sensor attached. So in order to, um, to connect this dashboard to, um, to Helium is by, um, if you go into the configuration in the uh, lower one section, you will see uh, an URL that you simply have to copy. You go uh, into the Helium console, create an HTTP integration. And actually uh, we are working with Helium right now to to make this uh, a pre-built pre -built integration so it's even easier, but not, even today it's it's pretty straightforward to, so you simply um, paste the URL as the endpoint URL and leave everything else uh, as default. Um, of course you have to give it a name. So I have done this before and um, attached a label to it and attached the label to the device. So the device is now sending it's uh, data to uh, the integration. Um, you don't have to set up scripts on the Helium console. Um, it's fine that the device is uh, sending the, the raw payload um, to Datacake um, because we also have payload decoders on Datacake and they come with the device templates. So um, let's switch to the uh, production dust control device, go into the configuration. So here you can, do things like set metadata at text. Text can be used in, in more complex dashboards and tables to filter devices. Um, also set an online timeout. So if you know that your device sends data every 30 minutes, you can, for example, set it to, to 40 minutes. And if the data, uh, device does not send data for 40 minutes, it will be considered offline and can send you a notification. And um, the most interesting part is down here in the um, Loravan config. Um, quick question, can you read uh, the, the text or should I make it a bit louder? Oh, someone has a dog. <laughs> I can read okay, it, it's, it's a little small, but it's, it's, I can read it. Yeah, okay, so yeah, I will explain. So um, right here we have the um, downlink configuration because we also um, support downlinks. So to send messages and data back to your device um, by default, um, it will populate the credentials from upstream messages. So every time Helium sends data to Datacake, the payload also contains all the information we need to, to craft a downlink message and send it back to Helium. So you can um, disable this and enter it yourself, but um, normally you can just leave it. And once the first packet comes in, all the information is populated. So as I said, we have the payload decoder, which in this case is for the um, for the, the dust control device. And um, it basically works like most other LoRaWAN JavaScript decoders you find out there with the exception that the, um, the data structure is a bit different because um, we also support um, multiple historic measurements in, in one message. So say you have a LoRaWAN device that transmits data every hour, but for 15 minute increments. So four measurements in, in one payload, then you can could do this here and um, apply a timestamp and it will be written into the database. So if we take a look at the debug tab, debug is yeah for debugging purposes, we can see the um, War webhook that came in from uh, Helium, and then can also see what the decoder returned for that message. So you see many fields here. Um, fields is, is a good, good thing. Um, if you go into the configuration, you see that um, the template has created, in this case, a lot of fields. So the field is, is like a variable that stores data and has a data type. So we support integer, float, uh, Boolean, strings, um, geolocations, um, 
things like that. Also counter fields, which are pretty cool. So um, yeah, I will talk about it later. Maybe it's, it's a bit too much detail right now. So um, as you can see, the data that the decoder sent uh, maps to these fields and store, um, they store their uh, data, data here. And um, to visualize the data, you go to the dashboard and um, this device has a pretty nice uh, pre-made dashboard. Uh, dashboard consists of widgets where you can display Boolean values, um, uh, measurements, um, can do things like time succeeded per day, and you can also display his historic values. Um, you can create dashboards without writing code. Um, we have this, what you see is what you get, drag and drop dashboard editor. And um, if you, for example, go into um, detail configuration of the field, you can, um, this is a Boolean widget, you can select which field you want to display, give it a name, add an icon, and uh, things like that. Um, same for the um, chart widget. You can um, add different fields, uh, configure the axes, um, show, show or not show grids, also select the time frame. And um, let me see, time succeeded per day should be. Yeah, I think if I'm correct, the um, device will send send a message when the threshold is exceeded or um, yeah, it's number of uh, limit exceeded. And then you can uh, do a time frame operation where we support minimum, maximum, average, some also change in absolute and percentage. So uh, for example, you could monitor a temperature change and display it like relative to the previous day, for example. But in this case, we are calculating the sum of all values from uh, today, which is like today, 12 a.m until now, which uh, here in Germany is 24 minutes later, but that's a nervous story. Um, yeah, um, we have different widgets. We have table widgets, map widgets, histograms. You can add text, headlines, um, things like that. And um, you can also create a mobile dashboard. So um, Datacake is responsive, so you can open the dashboard in, in your web browser and um, you can create a custom dashboard here because uh, like in some cases, like this is a pretty complex dashboard and you would want to rearrange it here. So um, you can do this. Um, yeah, another type of dashboard. So this is a device dashboard. This displays data from one device only. Another type of dashboards that's pretty popular with our users is a so-called global dashboard. You can add one to your workspace by clicking this button, give it a name. And um, let's add this dashboard. Can also add widgets here. So let's quickly, for demonstration purposes only. So, for example, the PM25 value. So now this dashboard is changed, uh, saved. And um, what you can do with global dashboards is make them public. So um, if you choose to make your dashboard public, you get a public link that you can share with anyone and um, they don't need to have a data cake account. So um, you can share this link, make it, make it public and you have an instant auto refreshing uh, public, public dashboard. Um, you can also add tabs to your dashboard. So, oops, saving. Um, if you want to display more data on a public dashboard, you can do this here, uh, switch tabs, so pretty, basic stuff. Um, another thing that's important is um, our rules engine. So uh, rules allow you to, uh, for example, send notifications if a measurement crosses a certain threshold. So um, let's give it a name, test. If the uh, device does control the field, PM25 is larger than whatever, 250, then you can uh, choose from different action types, send an email, send an SMS message, call a webhook. So for example, if you want to, to send a Slack message or integrate with another system, you can do this with uh, webhooks. Um, or you can also send uh, lower down links. Um, so for example, um, 
you could switch on ventilation if a CO2 level um, crosses a certain threshold. So you can connect different lower van devices to each other, not only lower van devices, of course. Um, there's, there are some more um, settings um, regarding to how often a rule is triggered if um, when it is reset and uh, things like that. Um, yeah, so speaking of, of downlinks, um, I think this is pretty cool as well. So um, earlier I went through the downlink configuration. So this is the data that we need to technically send a downlink to back to Helium or schedule the downlink. And to configure the actual downlink messages, you can do this here. And um, our LoRaWAN templates also include the downlinks from the manufacturers, but you can, of course, um, create your own downlink messages. So for example, here's one, it's called set RGB LED. So um, the dust control device has an RGB LED and you can um, set it via LoRaWAN downlink message. So if you take a look at what this uh, downlink looks like, it consists also of a JavaScript based encoder which um, takes in a list of measurements. So measurements, as I said earlier, are, uh, are the fields on, on data cake. So um, you can use data from fields which can be populated by uh, the sensor itself or by the user in the dashboard and use it to, to craft downlink messages. So in this case, we are using um, the state of um, RGB red, green, and blue to um, to create a binary payload that is then sent to uh, to the device. And we can set the port, of course. So um, if I click the button configure and send downlink, um, you can first configure it. And config by configure it, I mean set the value for the uh, fields. So for example, 255, 00, this should set it to red and click save and send downlink if we now Look into the debug tab. Oops, there it is. Send downlink to device, which is this payload. And um, don't know if uh, Simon can confirm, but the LED should be red now. <laughs> yeah. So um, these are downlinks. You, um, we are currently working on uh, making them available in the the dashboard as well, so we can have like quick action buttons to to toggle devices. And um, I think as, as many of you know, um, right now downlinks are technically sent to the device only when um, the device sends an uplink message. Um, this will change in the future with um, class C devices. But um, yeah, right now this device is uh, configured to send data every minute. So um, I just saw the data updating. So um, the downlink should now uh, have been sent to the device, yeah. So um, that's like a very quick walkthrough through, um, through, through data cake. Um, we also have things, of course, like members. So you can invite other people to your workspaces, give them permissions on, on devices. We have these rules. We have um, an option to, to white label the data cake portal. So to um, have it run on your own domain and uh, like remove the data cake branding. This is also what a lot of our customers are doing if they they are in the position to, for example, manufacture devices, sell them to their customers and they want to have like a managed IT platform. That's uh, when they come to us. And another thing is um, our managed node red offering called cake red. So, um, yeah, what the name implies is that uh, we offer a managed node red. So um, if you click here, um, this is an instance I created earlier. And um, we have data cake nodes for node red as well. So for example, we could connect a data cake in node, select our workspace, select the dust control device, select the PM25 field and have it debug and also send to a uh, Google Sheet that I set up earlier. We deploy and wait uh, a second or up to a minute until the new data comes in. 
Uh, I think there it is already. And let's switch to the Google Sheet. Oh, yeah, there it is. Pretty wild formatting, but uh, yeah, data is coming in, so it's pretty easy. Um, you can also use um, output nodes, um, which allow you to write measurements to uh, devices or even trigger downlinks. So you can then trigger LoRaWAN downlinks right from Node-RED. And of course, these nodes don't only run in our managed Node-RED called KGRED, but um, they are in the like public repository and can be added to any um, Node-RED instance, of course. So um, yeah, we have an MQTT broker, which is also what uh, our Node-RED nodes uh, use, use in the background. Um, we have REST APIs, GraphQL APIs, and um, yeah, are always, always open to feedback. And um, yeah, that's, as I said, a very, very quick walkthrough and I'm happy to answer your questions. If there are questions, <laughs> that's that's good. Thank you. I do have a couple of questions. Um, so the decoders, you do support uplink and downlink uh, decoders, and they are customizable, correct? May I that's create correct, my yes. own? Yes, you can. You can always create your own. Um, you don't have to use a, um, a template. So if you don't find your device in the list or uh, creating your own device, you can always choose generic LoRa device. Um, we are asking which device you are missing in case it's not in the list, and, but you can skip this and select Helium. And what this will do is it will create a, like an empty device with no decoder, no dashboard, mm -hmm. no fields. You can do it all yourself. Right, okay, good. Um, for the uh, notifications that you were talking, email, text, do you have any way of uh, supporting phone calls, like automated phone calls? Uh, yes, technically we do. We don't have this implemented yet, but what you could do right now is use Node-RED to interact, for example, with the Twilio API. But if this is, um, th but we could also build this feature into, into um, our own roots engine. Actually, you are the, the first person who, who really like requested it. But um, yeah, this we, we might take this on our roadmap. Well, don't take it as an official request because I'm just a hobbyist here. We we'll take my it as an idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, my idea is a water monitoring system. And, and in certain instances, I, t I tend to be in an old guy. I tend to ignore texts and emails, you know. So I'd like a phone yeah. call if it's like an emergency water problem. That's why I'm thinking that, that angle of it. Yeah, this totally would make sense. So um, what, what I did it? not show earlier is if you um, like configure the uh, notification, you can also insert um, insert measurements from, uh, from the device. So, um, so for example, in the text message, you could include the current temperature, for example. And mm -hmm. um, this would also allow you then to like have a text to speech and uh, like say it out to you by a phone call. Um, yeah. Okay. Actually, so we, you, we are, yeah. So you, we could hook something in via no, a node red hook. Yeah, um, actually, we are using a um, company called Twilio for uh, sending the SMS messages. And I know mm -hmm. that they also have a, a voice product. So uh, technically, it's totally possible. Um, and I think there are Twilio nodes for Node-RED. So it should be pretty straightforward to, to hook them up. OK, how does Node-RED tie into, I mean, you, you showed the, uh, OK, I've got a message from Helium. It goes into the decoder, the decoder sends it somewhere and it gets displayed on the uh, graphs. And you poke a button and that goes through the downlink decoder to Helium. Where does Node-RED hook into the flow? So um, Node-RED is like optional. So as I said, we have this MQTT broker. So right. every device sends its data also to, the, to our own MQTT broker. And you can um, create like API tokens to connect to this MQTT broker and do things with the data and send okay. data back. And uh, Node-RED is using this MQTT broker to hook up to the data, but it's it's not required in, in the flow. 
So it's kind of separate from the flow that you demonstrated yes, yes. here. Okay. It's like an add-on. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's. Oh, uh, your dashboards are. What's the word? Single layer. You don't have hierarchy. Drill down dashboards. Um, on the on the um, global dashboards, we have these tabs, but uh -huh. um, yeah. So they so could be set up for, for instance, company wide. Uh, floor um office kind of thing drilling yeah, down you can use you can use tabs for this tabs but you can also create an unlimited number of of dashboards mm -hmm. okay well, that's all i have thanks looks like a great product thanks lucas i'm curious without sharing your uh, state secrets um in terms of your roadmap what what are you guys working on like what's what should we expect uh in the next weeks or months that you'd, you'd like to share? Yeah, it's a very good question. And actually I um, wrote it into the, the um, data cake channel on the Discord earlier that um, we are currently evaluating like a user feedback tool uh, based on Kenny and the, the link is in the channel. So um, we are open to, to taking your feedback and um, this also allows you to, to vote on features. Um, so basically what we want to achieve is that our users like vote on our roadmap and decide what we are building next. But um, some things that we are definitely building right now are, for example, right now, if you say you have like a ton of the, the same sensors and want to set them all up. Um, right now, if you add the sensor and you want to make adjustments to the dashboard, you would have to do them for every device. You can copy and paste dashboards, but that's not so cool if you want to set up like a hundred sensors. So um, in the background, we are working on something called product. So product is like a device definition, and then you can add multiple devices to this definition and the definition uh, contains the dashboard contains the field. So it's pretty easy to, to set up a lot of the same devices because we are seeing that uh, many of our customers are doing this right now. Um, yeah, this is like the main thing we are working on right now. And I um, also briefly spoke about the community contributed templates. So um, basically make, make this a priority that users can create device templates, can create dashboards and share them with the community. So it's easy for them to get started. Nice. And you're gonna be able to create a set of rules for that product and that product, the rules carry over to each product, each of the same devices. Yes, um, that's also something very high on our priority list. There are some like conceptual and technical things we have to consider, um, but this is definitely something that's coming. Okay. Yeah, because if you have a hundred device, hundred sensors, and trying to build a, a set of rules for each one is kind of a pain. So. Yeah. So would would you have like the same threshold on on each device or? I would, I would ultimately like where the end of dashboard you could set what your threshold would be for each individual sensor. Okay, so but, basically have like a rule template on the, the product that populates to the device, but you still want to be like to adjust it for each device separately. Right. Okay, yeah, very good. It's to just, Thanks. just a small ask. Yeah, so. Yeah, but but a lot of a lot of customers were asking us about it, and we are trying to understand what they are about to do and to build a product like perfect for them. So it's very very important feedback for us. Thanks. Oh, I love it. By the way, I have been running two of my sensors on it as a test to uh, to show that my boss is that it does work. So thanks a lot. And so um, the one off the shelf sensor that I built is uh it use is working great the one i built is uh it's stalled out so i gotta go reset <laughs> it but not on the other end but just on my, problem I, have. I had a question i, I apologize the, if this uh, is... sorry eddie um if this is maybe sort of answered in documentation or not but as a developer i understanding with the white label platform um and does it work in such a way that I could spin up a device for somebody on sort of the free tier to like give them a trial? Uh, so they, you know, they get the week long data view um, or is it more the expectation that 
on, on those paid tiers, like every device is, is a new paid device. Yeah, so white label right now is, is really about branding. So um, that it's, it runs on your own domain. Um, you can have your own terms of service. You, you have like your own um, API domain, your own MQTT broker. But in the background, it's, it's all running on the same infrastructure. So um, regarding pricing, um, the, the pricing we have, the self-signer pricing is like for quantity one devices. If, if you come to us and say, yeah, I have this 100 or 1,000 devices, we can always make you a custom plan, of course. Um, yeah, I guess the, uh, I'm always happy to sort of show under the covers of how I'm putting something together. Uh, so happy to show data cake to clients and things like that. Um, but just as an example, like I've deployed six sensors for a, a company here and um, they're all effectively the same, but all sort of need to land in the one consistent dashboard. Um, and I've mostly been just doing it as a proof of set for them so far. Um, so. I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe I'll ask more specific questions in the Discord when I have got them. Uh, yeah, more totally. So um, you. you you can also with without the white label create like this this global dashboard. You can have your widgets with data from different devices. So have your six sensors on the same dashboard. Make mm -hmm. this a uh, public dashboard and copy the link. So this would include the app .data cake, uh, domain um, with white label. You this could be your own domain. But um, this this would yeah uh, allow you to to send like a dashboard link to to your client for evaluation. Yeah, no, it, it's super smooth for that. I guess the the part that hasn't gotten me to sit down and do it yet, aside from the time, is just that each device is a, sort of a, its own billing entity. Entity, um, but that's just I don't know. You're pricing super fair, so I think I'm counting pennies. <laughs> Thanks. So One thing that is you, really you, nice, Joey. Um, uh, with the white labeling is being able to uh, have people sign up you know um, through a form uh, on the site and it will create a workspace uh, for that new sign up uh, which, which is pretty slick so, so hold on well, let's let's make believe i'm joey inc and i have five different customers that i don't want to know about each other trap how would you how would that relate to what you just said, Travis? Would I have five different workspaces under Joey Inc. with the Joey, Joey label? How, how would that work with the white space and such? Or Lucas or whoever would know. How, how, yeah. how would, make it simple. How would that work? Um, so, um, so, so you you have a user account, and the user account is inside a so-called workspace, and workspace holds devices. If you yeah. sign up by, um, if you haven't, so I can go into um, the the members and um, invite you and input your email. And what happens then is when you sign up, you will automatically be added to this workspace and see the devices that I have added you. If you go to the white label site and sign up without having an invitation, you will basically see an empty device list. Um, I can then like share devices with you specifically, but um, it doesn't matter if you're on our data cake domain or on your white label site, it's uh, always Lucas. the same mechanism. Lucas, can you yeah. hear me? This yeah. is Simon, um, hello my, everybody. My... Yeah, I have your name because the thing is your invitation for this and um, I was doing some stuff and then I was also Lucas, but well, it's Simon and um, <laughs> um, you may um, maybe be able to differentiate us from the um, sound of our voice. So what I was going to, to answer or to add here is that we should now show something about the workspaces because that was something that we haven't talked about yet. And the request, the question that came up just a few uh, minutes ago, um, I think can be best answered with showing workspaces. So basically we do uh, Simon, you're cut off, but I think you wanted me to show workspaces. Is that correct? I take that as a yes. So, <laughs> um, internet in, in Germany is as good as uh, LoRaWAN coverage, by the way. So, uh, <laughs> okay, cool. So, on the um, 
top top left we have the so-called uh, workspace selector and um, by default if you sign up um, you can set a name for your uh, default workspace uh, but you can create as many workspaces as you like so let's call this one workspace two and at this workspace so this workspace now has an empty device list there are no devices in this workspace if I click add device, I can add my normal LoRa devices here, but also click the pin code. Um, so let's go back to my first workspace as, and go into the um, dust control device into the configuration. Um, down here, it should be, it's a bit small, I guess, but I will uh, read it out. So um, there is an option that you can enable, which um, will make the device um, that it can be claimed by other workspaces. And you can set a claim code. So let's set this to one to three. That's like pin code. Then you need the serial number of the device, which for LoRaWAN devices is the dev URI. And if we go into our uh, other workspace, this, um, I could give you the dev URI and pin code anyone, it, it's not limited to me. Um, I click add device, go to pin code, enter the serial number, pin code one, two, three, click add device, and the device is now also in the second workspace. Um, the second workspace does not have to like pay for the device because it is already paid for by the workspace that created it. But this allows you to, to share devices with other customers um, other than inviting them to your workspace. Um, yeah. Does that you make could, sense? <laughs> yeah, yes. And then could you then invite your, invite your customer to that workspace that you just created? And that would be their workspace for their devices. And only yes, they see that. yes, totally. And um, for example, what um, the, the Simon, Simon's family company Kemper is doing with their machines is they are all creating the devices in like the company workspace, creating uh, pin codes for the devices and printing them on the physical machine that they are shipping to their customers. So what their customers can then do is, so um, the manufacturer does not have to in, invite um, its customers, but it ships the machine with the pin code label on it and the customer signs up on their white label site or on, on uh, data cake and clicks add device, enters the information from the label and has access to this uh, device instantly. Very cool. Very and the nice. member list is, is discrete between the workspaces. And so um, uh, members in one workspace will not be visible um, to the other workspaces, correct? Yes, that's correct. Is this what is this scenario we talked about? Is that what workspaces are for, or is that just one use of a workspace? Um, so workspaces are like organizations or tenants. So it's it's like a way to to group devices, but also group users. So um, what we wanted to to avoid is only having like user accounts where you have all your devices from from different uh, companies or different use cases. So um, it's, it's like an, an easy way to separate the, also the billing from the actual use of the device. Yeah, so basically, um, I'm back by the way, I found an ethernet cable. Um, basically the answer is very simple. It's just one use case. So we do have customers using the workspaces to separate their end customers, but they are also using the workspaces in their own company to separate areas, buildings, or even projects. Um, we do have some R&D um, um, companies or companies that do R&D stuff, and they um, use the workspaces to separate them. And as you can see, we've created a workspace for this Helium Hex Happy Hour. Um, so it's called that workspace. Um, so you can use workspaces wherever you need a complete separation. But um, as Lucas is just showing the member sections, what would be also possible is that under um, add member, if you invite a member, you can also define which devices that member has access on. So that means you can have um, a short or a simple layer of um, yeah, access control right in the workspace itself. 
But if you want to have a full separation between those um, things, you can create workspaces for your end customers. And the good thing about that is, even if you run a white label solution on Data Cake and your end customers use that white label solution, the end customer then would be also able to still um, use his own white label if in some ways he wants to have his own portal of data cake. So this is, um, there's no um, limitation on how many workspaces you can have members and so on. So simply there are um, all different use cases possible with using workspaces. And another thing I believe that you mentioned, but I'd like to um, kind of bring this back up is within a workspace, uh, the billing, aspect of it that can be paid by a card for that workspace that's not tied to i guess the uh, the general owner of the account or the white labeled account correct and so you you yeah. have um you know billing going to different people for different workspaces yeah so billing is defined by the the workspace and um the workspace paying for the device is always the workspace where it has been first created so as I said, a device can be in, in multiple workspaces, but um, only the, the first workspace where it has been created is, is paying for the device. device I think that's be, an incredibly, incredibly cool function there. A, a device could be running in multiple workspaces at the same time. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So technically it's the same device, but multiple workspaces have access to it. Oh, this if is you, very powerful. This is very if you, powerful. If you delete a device in one workspace, does it delete it from the rest of them? Or can you only delete the device in the workspace that it was created in? Um, right now you can create through? it in, uh, right, right now you can um, delete it in every workspace if I'm not mistaken, but this is something we've been thinking about a lot in the past and are, are working on making this like configurable so um, that you can allow or disallow this. Yeah, but basically it doesn't doesn't matter because it's not deleting. If you are the ultimate creator of the device and you delete it, it's deleted for everyone. But if a customer in your sub workspaces has this device as well, and he presses on delete, there's a notification saying you um, are going to remove that device from the workspace, but you are not going to delete it. So basically it's not deleted, it's just removed from the workspace. As you can see here, the button says remove device from workspace and not delete. And um, on the um, root workspace where the device was created on, it's then delete. Um, so the device is being deleted. Yeah, uh, Simon, sorry, you're, you're totally right. Um, it's, it was a bit, was a bit late. Uh, yeah. But uh, <laughs> if you go to delete ah. device here, it says delete device permanently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, while you're on this page, would you mind uh, pulling up the configuration for M MQTT right there? Yeah, sure. Uh, so um, MQTT integration, this has this uh, um, configure and enable batch, but actually MQTT is always enabled for all devices. And this model gives you like a um, quick overview of, of how it works. It's like the short version of the documentation with um, just the information you need to subscribe to data from this device and uh, publish to, to this device. So um, our MQTT topic is uh, made up of first uh, prefix, in this case, uh, DTCK, and then the um, products like this will make sense when we have like uh, published the, the products in the coming weeks and then the device ID and followed by the field name, or in this case, a wildcard. And if you want to publish to a device, it has a different topic. This um, has like access control reasons um, because um, users on, on DataCake as well as API tokens can have different permissions. So for example, you could create an API user that can only read data from a device, but not like publish data to a device. This is why we have this um, separation here. Um, yeah, and um, with the products, you will also be able to like subscribe to data from all devices in this one product, but this is like on a roadmap for the coming weeks. So for it's example, you could possible. subscribe to data from all your temperature sensors. Yeah. And could you also show the, um, because you were speaking of API tokens, 
in the member section, how you create API tokens for different access scopes and how you can separate these from um, all the other users, because I think that's also a pretty cool feature. Of course, so API users work like normal users, except you don't need like an email address. And um, as you can see, this workspace has a cake red API user, which was created automatically when I like um, started the, the cake red instance. And here you can see the permissions. So this is uh, workspace permissions. Um, so this token can manage the basics like name and logo of the workspace, members, billing, cake red itself, devices, rules, white label, um, but can also set um, device permissions. So as we showed earlier, you can set uh, permissions for individual devices or as a wildcard for all devices in, in workspace and device permissions consist of uh, first is the view permission. So every user that has a permission on a device automatically can view the device and its data, but also edit the metadata, edit the device definition. So device definition is fields, payloads, decoders, stuff like that. And um, lastly, can record measurements. So if you want to this user uh, to allow this user to like manually write uh, write data, for example, in the dashboard or via MQTT. So this is the KGRAD API user. You can also add another test, oops, test user. Let's just give it basics uh, permissions and view permissions on all devices. Then you can click show and um, use this API token to authenticate both the REST API, GraphQL API, and also MQTT. So this is a test workspace, so it doesn't matter that this is in the recording. <laughs> <laughs> so is this, it. Would you be doing this if you wanted to send data out of the data cake space, say to an AWS, some other destination space? Is this is this what you how you'd be so, setting up the authentication for that? Uh, yes and no. This is one way. So um, another, so so one way would be to to use rules to like send data selectively. So for example, only if the temperature crossed cross a certain threshold, then you could use the uh, webhook action inside a rule to call like an external system. Um, as I said, you could use this to to like speak with the Slack API to to send your uh, message there but also to ingest data into to AWS or other systems. Um, you would need an API token for the pull approach. So for example, if you have like an, a script running somewhere that connects to MQTT and adjusts the data into another system, or you have another script that um, in an interval pulls our API. So we have an API to extract the current and historic data from a device. Um, so you can use this to like get the current data on demand or also regularly fetch the data and push it into another system. Some of our customers are doing this. Yes, okay. and there's also the way that you can use that to um, bring data into Data Cake. Um, yes. With Helium, we are using the integration, but there are also some users who have no red or um, any other hardware, and they want to use MQTT to write some stuff, so they could create an API token which has just um, the access right on a single device. And you can use that token to bring extra data into data cake. And also it's possible to um, secure the communication between Helium and data cake, which is um, by default secured because it's using SSL encryption. But in addition, um, we supply or we, we give the option to um, authenticate the webhook, the integration. So um, this is um, deactivated, but if you um, activate that, you would um, then enter um, yeah, the API key in the Helium console. So yeah. um, the API tokens are, um, can be used for both ways. So to get data out of Data Cake and to get data back into Data Cake. By default, so we don't have by default a way to like validate that the data Helium sends us is actually coming like from your device or your user or um, actually Helium. So um, you can use this if you enable authenticate webhook, then every time Helium sends data to us um, identified by your device's dev URI, then we also match the um, token in the header that you would have to set in the um, data cake 
integration. So if you go into the integration, you would have to add a header called authorization um, and the value would be token and then followed by your token. And this would make sure that your device's data can only be written by your actual integration. Otherwise, in rare cases, someone would theoretically be possible to craft like a, a fake payload using your dev URI and write data into your device if you know your device's dev URI. But uh, we never saw this in the past, but we wanted to give like advanced use cases the possibility to authenticate the webhook. Yeah, so it's an added security layer, nothing that is that is required, but it's an added security layer. Yeah. But it's disabled by default because um, it, it makes things harder, yes. <laughs> yeah, it complicates stuff, yeah. Um, could you quickly touch on the, um, the history and um, the export functionality that you have on device history? Of course, it's, it's a good time because um, I started this device earlier and now we have like two hours of data already. So if you go to the um, history, then you have a list of, of your fields. And for example, if we select the PM10, PM25, and PM40, PM100 maybe, wait a few seconds. And right now it's set to, yeah. So um, this is like, yeah, the historic data basically. You can set the time frame, see which data you want to uh, see. Um, select the, the fields and then you can also um, click the export chosen view button and export it to Excel, CSV, JSON, YAML. Um, also select if you want to export the raw data or if you want to quantize by, for example, 15 minutes intervals. So um, yeah, this this feature was actually re requested by, of course, a German company who was, who was like living in Excel and wanted to to export day. This was a fun use case. Um, two years ago, we've been to the Munich Oktoberfest and um, we're working with a company that uh, produced like ultrasonic based flow sensors for liquids. So in other words, they were measuring the beer flow in, in a tent. And um, before we came in, they had these sensors connected to actual computers running like some visual basic Windows scripts that were recording the data into Excel, uh, things like that. And bad things happened. They had like this very long sensor lines running into the central tent where the computer was standing. And um, overnight, some like copper thieves came in and stole the cables or the cables were laid next to like high voltage lines and there was interference so nothing was really reliably working and they were looking for a solution to to get the data from the sensor right where the sensor is so um, that's that's where we where we came in so um, we connect their sensors to a device that sent the data um, back then it was sent by a cellular um, to the cloud and um, they could like monitor the beer flow in real time, but also it was very important for them export it to Excel so um, they, they could do, do business things with it. Can we sign up to be a beta tester next time for the beer flow? <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> so I was just um, taking a look at the chat and I was in parallel while you were doing some um, explanation on the video, um, writing some things in the chat. And I just saw a question popping up about integrating the hotspots as well. So what we do have already is an integration for um, the TTN network so that users can add their gateways. And our plan is because we had a look at the um, Helium API and our um, plan is to have hotspots here as well. Um, this is something that we um, really would like to see because it would be cool if you have your hotspot also on um, data cake. And um, we were also having a look into the um, API and we think, oh, we see some, some quite some nice functions here. So um, yes, this is on our roadmap. Um, there are some things that have higher priority right now because um, yeah, they are really needed. Um, I was watching the video with my slow internet connection right at the beginning. And um, somebody was asking about the, I think, Adam, was that you? No. Um, anyway, um, someone was asking about the roadmap. And um, I also have some details which I would like to share, which is about um, things that we would like to add in 2021. Um, what we were seeing here back in 2020 was 
that a lot of people brought their air quality monitors, CO2 monitors to Datacake. And uh, we know that, um, that we have a few functions miss missing for showing, um, yeah, um, like air quality in um, or large amount of air quality sensors. So what we would like to bring is um, features for um, showing sensors on a map and to to um, add some layers like air quality and stuff like that. Um, these are also some features that we um, yeah have planned for 2021, just in addition. And to bring some more features for the dashboard builder and to make everything a little bit easier. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Features on a map would be nice. Like there's the location. I know in my dashboard I have the location of the sensor, but to be able to show location and a, a reading or something, that'd be nice, especially if you're distributed across an area or whatever. Exactly. Um, I had a phone call with a customer last week and he was, I was telling them um, the same. And um, he was, was telling me that we should, if we do layers on top of that map, we should be able, or we should definitely bring in the function that you could have access to weather map. So he was um, monitoring a fleet of cars and he wanted to give his customers the option um, to blend in a weather map so that he can see where the trucks are in bad weather conditions or stuff like that. Um, Lucas right now is showing um, how the map widget currently works. And we still think that this is a good example if you are working with a position on a single device or on a single device dashboard. But we want to keep things easy here. And what we want to do is like having a map deeply integrated into Datacake. So basically there will be a feature on the sidebar where it says map, you click on that, you see the map. And on that map, you see all the devices um, that have a position field. Um, so means that for this, we will bring in some metadata like location, because we think that all these device, devices do have locations because they are physical, of course. And um, this will yeah, auto generate a map with your devices that have locations um, set. And then there's a layer which you can um, set. And I am personally um, a great fan of heat maps. So heat maps, heat maps is something that is coming. And we do have um, customers that using um, these um, LoRaWAN parking space monitors and of course, they can be just monitored in a single table and you can see, um, yeah, what's the situation of that parking space, but you want to see them on the map. So these are the functions that we have. Like, um, this is our vision where we want to go and we're moving step to step to these, um, yeah, more features. Nice. Hey, Simon and Lucas, thank you so much for the uh, presentation today. It's really appreciated, especially given the time of day it is there. Yeah, <laughs> you're absolutely welcome. Um, it's it's just what's that one a.m. So, but it's okay. Yeah, five hours and then um, the coffee machine is switched on. <laughs> <laughs> also, also for yeah, the future, we are always around in in Discord, and there's like a chat widget on on Datacake that you can use to uh, to communicate with us and we try to respond as fast as possible. And thanks for um, being here so that we um, had the chance to be here and to present that. And uh, yeah, we are super excited about your community. So we see where we, let's see what we, what we can do here. I just want to, uh, this is George Newman uh, from One Planet Education. Um, I've been working with Travis with the, uh, you guys indirectly. And I just wanted to thank you for your yeoman efforts in a short period of time and the great turnaround on, on some of the things we've needed, you know, to test out. And uh, you guys are doing some great work and we're looking forward to working with you more closely. Um, and thank you, Travis, for putting this together tonight and you guys for staying up late. And I hope your coffee machine lights up <laughs> as it should in the morning. <laughs> thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, um, the coffee machine, definitely. I checked it, so it, it runs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I checked it an hour ago, so uh, uh, an hour and a half, so it should be fine. <laughs> but yeah, um, just, just to pile on there, uh, thank you guys very much. I know it is late over there, and this has been a, a fantastic presentation. I know a lot of people in the Helium community have been looking for a dashboarding <clears throat> you know, option uh, yeah. recently. And I think this really just fills um, a lot of the gaps and what folks are looking for on an easy to use, uh, but still very functional uh, dashboarding setup. Um, and also this wasn't really touched on too much, but um, like compared to other dashboarding solutions, the, the pricing on this is fantastic. Uh, 
it's, you know, if anyone hasn't really looked through, you know, what's available out there, um, the, the numbers on this look great. Thanks. Thanks. That's, that's very, very good to hear. So I also want to add that um, in the future, if someone has questions or like a, a use case you want to talk about, we're always available for like a one-on-one -on -one video chat and just hit us up. Uh, would it be on the, on the website or in the Discord and we will arrange a meeting then. It would be handy too to be able to select the currency that it comes up in because I don't know what the, the US to pounds is. But. Uh, yeah, so actually, actually it's it's in in euros. So um, what's Earth the current euros. exchange rate? Like one euro in USD. So one euro is one point two US dollars. I remember times it was one point eight or stuff like that. Crazy. Yeah, it was was almost one to one at the time. But yeah, not sure what happened in the country. <laughs> Actually, I noticed this morning I installed the mobile app and I know some of the, I'm in the United States, I know some of the menus are still coming through in German. Did I, oh. did I miss a configuration setting or um, it, is it not all translated on the mobile app? Um, yes, the state with the mobile app is that um, we are currently developing two systems at a time. And we are currently keeping the mobile um, app like it is because we do have customers that were accessing it and using it. Um, then we have these white label customers and for them, the mobile app wouldn't work. So um, we were concentrating on making the um, web front end more mobile friendly so that you can open that up on the website. And we are concentrating more and more on that. So sooner or later, um, the native app um, we will, yeah, um, still leave that on the store, do some smaller um, things for that. But um, in the end, it will be that the web portal is the stuff that will be shown on the mobile app as well. Um, so it can be that there are on the native app some things that are not yet translated. Um, but for example, on the um, web interface, we are using this like 90%. So if we see something where it's, where it is not translated, I know from Travis that there are some tool tips, which are not yet translated. Um, if you go into the history, for example, and then you hover yeah. over the yeah. settings, um, this is something that is not yet translated. Um, if you just find something, just please report that. And, um, we will, um, of course, translate that to English. The, the 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 German word for temperature is very close to the English word. So that, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, that one. So was, just yeah. missing the just missing the e at the end. <laughs> yeah, it, it 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 also could be that um, a template. Um, one of the things that we are really looking forward for personally is that we bring in the option that the community is able to contribute to our template section. Um, because two reasons for that. Currently, it's us um, that the ones that we are, um, we are the ones that um, are doing the templates. And we were trying to find someone taking over this work, but it's super hard to find someone to have knowledge in the Loravan centers and so on. And then on the other side, we see super uh, um, work on the community. Um, so we want to um, make sure that the community has the option to contribute to our template section because, and that's um, maybe the reason why there was a German word in it. So temperature um, um, it is. is that- I, It is, I'm yeah. looking at it now. It is the template for the particular device that I have. Yeah. May Maybe someone just simply forgot on the template that was me <laughs> to um, bring in the English translation. That's an easy fix. I will, yeah, just look through the templates. I could also be a good time for you to brush up on a second language. Well, I know that um, I believe relative humidity in German is Luftfeuchtigkeit or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <It's> Luftfeuchtigkeit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well on your way, well on your way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's so good to speak English because in Germany, in German, we have so many complicated words. <laughs> so hey, like guess, relative Luftfeuchtigkeit. Um, I, I was, I, it took me 40 minutes this morning to sign up for data cakes, hook up my device, and see data flow to my phone. It was like 40 minutes, and I had never looked at data cakes ever before. That's quite amazing. Yeah. It was very yeah. easy. Yeah. Very. That's good to hear. Yeah.
it took me a little that's, longer, that's, but I, I had so many problems that they, uh, the, the guys were great. They were, they instantly fixed my stuff. They, they got tired of trying to walk me through it. And they just like, let, all right, give us the access to your account. So. No, you folks have like, been yeah. outrageously uh, responsive. Uh, to the community yeah. as far as as far as helping people you know get on board and you know get get something set up here uh, that that's fantastic and anyone who um, didn't catch this earlier there is a discord channel uh, within the helium discord that's dedicated to data cake and if you have a question that's uh, that's probably a pretty good place to to jump in there so so is yeah. is that the discord you're referring to i thought maybe there's a, di a it's not a data cake discord server ah, so it? no i was, was re referring to the helium discord and the data cake oh. channel over there okay and so i want to be respectful of these guys time um you know thank you very much for presenting this evening um i know it is very late there but if anyone has any quick questions uh, you know before we wrap this up we're we've already gone what know, about 20 minutes over uh, which which i have no problem with you know but uh, <laughs> it's it's what 120 over there uh, yeah, 120. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you very much. No, and if anyone okay. has questions, um, they can reach you on the Discord channel or in your chat on the Data Cake site itself. Thank you very much. Yeah, You're welcome. Thanks. So, with that, um, I guess I'm going to uh, wrap this call up. And um, I'm, I'm excited. If, if anyone hasn't played with Data Cake, please grab an account and um, and check this out. Next week, same bad time, same bad channel. Uh, everyone have a safe week, and um, I look forward to seeing you then. Take care, everyone. Take care. Right. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thank you. Everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye.